Well, as Jordy said, thank you for coming out on this uh, non-perfect night. Um, but thank you for, for coming. And this is going to be a, a fun night. Um, just a, a, a brief backstory. Tom and I met, uh, had some email exchanges in the spring in which he described his work. And then we met in Chicago in June at an event at the Institute. And as I was leaving Chicago, I thought you know, it would be great to bring him here and, and in the context of a SIU success story, how someone who uh, came here, studied, has created his own company, is doing some really interesting and creative work. So as Jordy said, what I like to do is, I used to be a reporter, so I'm going to see if I still remember how to do this. Uh, uh, I'll try to listen more than talk. I know that's sort of a departure from current journalistic practices. But, but just ask some questions about um, um, you know, Tom's career, how he got started. Talk about 15 minutes or so, then we'll look at the clip. Uh, and then uh, open it up and have a, you know, at least a good 20 minutes for Q&A. So hopefully that will be a format that works. So Tom, tell, I mean, you're from near Kankakee. Describe how you ended up in Carbondale. What was the uh, progression of events? Uh, certainly. Um, so I grew up in a little town called Hersher, uh, which is a whopping metropolis of about 1,300 people. I think it's 1,600 people at the last census. So it's growing, which is an anomaly among small farming communities. Um, but I knew I wanted to go to film school. So I started looking around and, you know, the usual suspects of, uh, you know, USC, Columbia, and Chicago. Um, and I was actually telling John a little earlier that I kind of applied to SIU on a whim. It was kind of my safety school. I didn't know a whole lot about it. Um, but I came down for a campus visit and I just fell in love with the campus. Um, you know, visited the communications building. There was a small, you know, little office and kind of this dungy basement. If any of you have been in the basement of the communications building, maybe it's been remodeled, but no. I doubt it. Um, but that was the charm of it, was this actually reminded me of a, a publications office in high school, and it really just seemed like a good fit. Just had a gut feeling that this was the right place, and I, I think it was. And so in terms of studies, did you just focus largely on photography and cinema, or what was sort of, were you convinced that this was the direction you wanted to go? You know, I, I always wanted to do historical documentaries. I was a big Ken Burns buff, you know, in grade school and high school. So I actually have a minor in journalism uh, that I think has come in a little handy, and then uh, a minor in history as well. So I... I I wanted to really take advantage of everything like a large university had to offer in that, you know, you didn't just have to study your area of expertise. You could kind of, you know, those other interests that were out there. Um, so I, I feel that I took a good advantage of what was here. Was there a class or professor that was particularly kind of um, significant or or is it more just the accumulation you of know, classes and professors? There were, there were a lot. Um, you know, one that was really striking was there was a journalism class that was taught by Paul Simon. Mm -hmm. um, it was, I think, uh, maybe like a nonfiction news writing class or a, non, or a nonfiction writing class, you know, something that very much fit documentary <laughs> world. Or not nonfiction, sorry, narrative nonfiction is the, yes, thank you for uh, catching that. Um, and uh, because there is a lot of uh, fictional news these days. Um, who knew he was ahead of his time um, in more ways than one. Uh, that stood out a lot. Um, also, uh, you know, a cinema professor, uh, Mike Cavell, was a big influence. He, uh, you know, he was very kind of laissez-faire in his style, but he would kind of challenge you to come up with your own, own ways to solve problems. Like there was no right or wrong way, but he wanted you to work through it. And that, that was, you know, that struck me very much as well. So as you're finishing up school, I'm sure your parents are saying, so where are you going to find a job? I mean, take it about the transition from finishing up at SIU until the real world, what you, what you did. I, I still feel that I don't live in the real world. Uh, you know, I get to make documentary films, which doesn't seem like a real job. Um, so I guess the transition, you know, I, I, I really didn't know what to do. Uh, I actually went to grad school for about two months. Um, but 
I had conned a couple of other SIU alums into working on a project that kind of interests me. I saw the, um, so just outside of Kankakee, there's this uh, small town called Piatone, which at the time was going to be the site of the next O'Hare Airport. It was going to be a third airport for sh Chicago, uh, you know, this massive Denver International Airport looking thing. And it was going to be built in farm fields that looked a lot like the town I grew up in. And I thought, this is something we should follow. You know, let's, let's try to make a movie, why not? Um, they didn't know any better, I didn't know any better. So I ran off to grad school and they started working on this project. Well, about two months into grad school, I thought, what am I doing at grad school? I should be working on this film. So I've kind of taken over that project and little did I know that I'd still be working on that one today. Um, <laughs> Uh, made some other documentaries in between, but that first project is, is still ongoing. So let's walk through the, the sort of the major projects you've done. Uh, why don't you just give us kind of a Certainly, crowd? certainly. So for a, a large part of my, you know, early on I was kind of an editor for hire. Um, I was working at a company that did kind of what we call docutainment, uh, things for like Animal Planet biography. You know, I did a, you know, was the editor on the Eric Estrada biography, you know, that, you know things of that nature. Um, which were great, you know, they paid the bills, but then at the same time was always trying to get, um, you know, kind of more personal projects off the ground. I eventually uh, worked at a PBS station in Northwest Indiana for a short time, and there I kind of met people that had similar interests, and we kind of formed this loose collaboration of, you know, none of us, you know, we all kind of have our own companies, but we all worked together on all of these projects. So really the first major project was this Everglades of the North, which um, came out of, you know, it was actually a, an intern at the TV station. She was a very interesting lady. She uh, had worked in the steel mills for a long time. So she was a 50 year old intern. And after she finished up her internship, she's like, I'm gonna make this movie. Well, she roped myself and um, my former boss at the TV station into helping her produce it, and we kind of took on a lot of the editing and writing, and um, you know, along with a, a reporter in the area by the name of Jeff Manis. Um, so we had this team of four, and we took about two years off and on to create this environmental history documentary. Um, it was more successful than we could possibly imagine. It, we thought we were just making a little local uh, piece for you know Northwest Indiana. It ended up being carried all over the country. In a uh, word or two, describe what it was. What the, um, it was really the history of the draining of one of the largest inland marshes in North America um, in the cornfields of Indiana. Uh, it was once this vast swamp. Well, at the turn of the 20th century, that was drained off to make way for farmland. And the effects of that you know, were great for the economy because farmers could use that land, but um, there are estimates that over a third of the migratory bird population in the United States disappeared because of the draining of that wetland. Um, so it's really a story of kind of our relationship to the environment. Um, and then we followed that one up with um, one about the Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore much the same format, it's kind of an, an environmental history, but that one is about how industrial interests and conservation interests both clashed on that lakeshore. Um, if you've ever been to Northwest Indiana, the steel mills are a very prevalent site, but in the shadow of those steel mills is some of the most biodiverse landscape in the world. Um, one director of the National Park Service has mentioned that um, for the size of the park, it has mo more, di more biodiversity than any other park in the entire United States. You know, it's comparable to you know, Yosemite and Yellowstone in just these few thousand acres. Um, and that conflict actually helped spur a lot of the conservation and environmental movement in the United States. Uh, and so these were both very kind of untold environmental history stories. Um, a lot of times in the Midwest, we think that, you know, the, all the great environmental battles happened, you know, on the West Coast or, you know, in the Everglades or some, you know, these grand monuments, and really a lot of them have happened 
right here in kind of smaller pockets. And then um, after that, I did a little bit of a change of pace. Um, was no longer uh, in the environmental history world, but more the architectural history, uh, because be before becoming a film student, I thought I wanted to be an architect, but I was not all that great at math, and I couldn't draw. <laughs> so I thought I'd better find a, something else to do. Um, but outside of uh, my hometown was this uh, early Frank Lloyd Wright house um, in Kankakee, Illinois. And it just so happens that it's argued to be uh, Wright's first prairie style design. I had no idea about this because when I was growing up, the house was shuttered, abandoned, because the house and the community had fallen on very tough economic times. So the trajectory of that story was really trying to connect the history of this very important work of architecture with the community and to kind of show that the, this house became a symbol of the people of that community and its economic you know, trials and tribulations and ultimately, we're hoping, resurgence. Uh, there's kind of some very wonderful things happening in this town of Kankakee these days. Um, has a long way to go yet, um, but uh, so that was my most recent project, at least that I was kind of the main producer on. Um, you know, within that, there's kind of works for hire and things like that that get filtered in to pay the bills, but that's, and then I guess there is the uh, Pia Tone project that is still uh, looming over my head, but we're actually trying to make, uh, myself and my production partner, we're trying to make a very big push uh, to finish that project uh, within the next six months. And what is the takeaway from that project? The takeaway from that project, it's been a kind of a moving target over 15 years, as you may expect. Um, when it started, I started following it in about 2002, and at that point, it looked like it was going to happen in a matter of a year, that they were going to be taking people's land via eminent domain. Um, so it was really going to be kind of this study of displacement and, um, you know, and just how this community and kind of a, a portrait of a community that had been lost. Well, it changed because this has been one of the more interesting political sagas in a state that has a lot of interesting political <laughs> sagas. Um, it, it's, it, 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 it's gone in fits and starts for years and years, um, but the state of Illinois still owns several, thousands, several thousand acres of land within this, just outside this community. So the airport footprint is mostly owned by the state of Illinois, uh, but the project is currently kind of mothballed by the current administration. But depending on the election, it could very, mu it could very easily get ramped up again. Um, but our new take is really that it's kind of a story of two communities kind of fighting for what they see as best for them or how to survive. Um, these rural communities are trying to fight the airport, keep it away to kind of save their, you know, their way of life, their farms. But for suburbs and the south side of Chicago that had been, you know, very much impacted by the loss of industrial jobs in the 1980s, this is seen as, you know, an economic savior. If this thing can, can be, become another O'Hare, it'll be, you know, the economic engine for an entire region. So we're really following that debate. Um, and I think it's kind of becoming a more interesting story, really, as the time has, has passed. So maybe this is a good context to watch the clips in. Why don't you just give everyone kind of a setup as to what we'll be looking at? Certainly. So what you're going to see are actually uh, trailers. Um, so for Everglades of the North, you'll see kind of the trailer and a short excerpt from the open. Um, for Shifting Sands, you'll see the trailer. Um, and then uh, the same for uh, the, ho the story about the Frank Lloyd Wright house. Uh, it's called An American Home. Uh, you'll see a short excerpt from that trailer. Um, and then for the uh, airport film, you'll see a short bit from the trailer and then also um, kind of a, a short sample scene that we're still uh, putting together. So I think it runs about maybe 10 or 11 minutes uh, and hope it spurs some questions. And Not long ago, there was once an area in the Midwest that resembled the swampland of Florida's Everglades. 
the Grand Kankakee Marsh, a nearly one million acre wetland. This was an area that was called Everglades of the North. It was one of the richest wildlife habitats in all of North America. It was an incredibly dense collection of natural resources that could be exploited. From furriers to farmers, many sought the riches of the marsh, but at a costly price. It's a missing piece of American ecology. It was gone before they understood it. It really was something God had set aside and man shouldn't have rendered asunder. Only a fraction of this wetland has survived. What became of the Grand Kankakee Marsh, the Everglades of the North? Eighteen ninety-three, the city of Chicago hosts the World's Fair and Columbian Exposition, a glittering showcase for man's triumphs in shaping the world to his will. At the same time, just forty miles south of the White City, in the small town of Moments, Illinois, near the Indiana border, a real-world example of man's push for so-called progress is the center of a fiery debate. At issue is a rock ledge that is believed to back up more than 200 miles of the Kankakee River, making possible the Grand Kankakee Marsh, one of the largest inland wetlands in the United States. For the past several years, wetlands across the country have been drained to make way for settlement and highly prized farmland. Despite massive ditching efforts, the obstinate Grand Kankakee Marsh is slow to drain. Some believe removing the moment's rock ledge will increase the flow of the river and rapidly drain the marsh once and for all. But it is hotly contested whether too much of its irreplaceable habitat has been ravaged already. Farmers, geologists, sportsmen, and politicians from Indiana and Illinois rally for each side of the debate. Finally, after months of squabbling and some legal sleight of hand, the fate of the Grand Kankakee Marsh is decided. On the south shore of America's Great Lakes, there exists an ecological marvel unlike any place else in the world. The topography here, it exists no place else on the planet. This is probably one of the most studied landscapes in America. Here, 10 distinct ecosystems combine to produce an immense array of life. There are more than 350 species of birds here and almost 1,100 species of flowering plants, almost as many plants as in all of Great Britain. This region would become the birthplace of ecological science in North America, and it would help establish the very roots of the modern environmental movement. Also on this shoreline, the richest men in American history would find a perfect location for their industrial expansion industry brought in prosperity, jobs for the future, but the cost of that was heavy. The area was deemed to be one of the most polluted in the country. Literally, there was nothing living in the river. This collision of nature and industry would inspire ordinary citizens to take action. For over a century, a battle raged over this 45-mile stretch of sandy shore, and out of that battle, may emerge a world where community, nature, and industry can endure together. In a quintessential American town, there is a building like none other. This is the house that changed the face of American architecture. And the reason that this house is special is because it created new spaces and looked at spaces a different way. This home, 
would help establish the reputation of one of the world's greatest architects. Frank Lloyd Wright is uniquely our American hero of architecture. Here he's testing his ideas in a way that creates magic when you walk into these spaces. And it would symbolize a region's growing economic prosperity. This was at a time in the Midwest, around the turn of the century, when the region is realizing its importance to American culture and expressing that through the art of architecture. But this home's architect and its surrounding community would face trying times. He has this decade in the 20s when he's lost and struggling. Kankakee went from an industrial town to almost a ghost town. Literally, thousands of jobs were lost. The house had fallen into disrepair. Just a sad reminder of a glorious past and a pretty uncertain future. Frank Lloyd Wright would reinvent himself in order to survive and flourish. Can the community that houses one of his most important works do the same? There is no greater job generator in the world than an airport. Airports are economic development engines. We're going to need to build a South Suburban Airport. Let's build the Piatone Airport. June 1st of this year. It's going to be called the South Suburban Airport. Big projects take a while, but this is absurd. I've been opposed to this airport for 25 years. Yes, have I. The tragic thing is they may take people's land. Maybe this is a new stage in the U.S. where people have to fight for land rights. Projects that have public interest at heart will have a ground zero horrible repercussions. We are in a hostage situation. If you like your home, stay there and fight. We're playing with people's lives. We really just need it to end. This is uh, Alice Chalmers' 1948 B tractor, same year as me, and she runs better than I do. I'd grown up in Chicago, and I always wanted to live out in the country. And so I'd saved up some money for a down payment, and I started searching rural areas for some property. Eventually found this 10 acres, and I thought, wow, this is the place. It's very peaceful out here. You know, to come from the city out here is uh, kind of like exhaling, you know, that's very peaceful. And I think it's good for the soul to be out here. On the day I closed on this property, and this was in 1985, and it just so happened I looked in a newspaper that day, and there was a small article uh, saying that State Senator Aldo DeAngelis wanted to bring an airport south of the south suburbs. And uh, I thought to myself, wow, that's where I am, south of the south suburbs. And uh, so I filed it away in my mind and uh, did not have any idea what a monstrous situation this would turn into. We're talking about a 50-gate airport in Piatone, correct? Well, that's the initial first phase. First phase. Right. And the, it's estimated that the airport could be operational by the year 2000? It could open up as early as 1998. The governor is saying year 2000. At first, I was in kind of denial, and I didn't want to get involved. It gained momentum, and it was in the news a lot, and they were having five different potential sites. And then uh, Governor Edgar, uh, says, oh, we're going to do Piatone. And that's when it really hit me. That they are marshalling the resources of the state of Illinois 
to uh, make it happen and uh, uh, just got involved in, in the resistance to the airport. It is my privilege to introduce to you the president of Shut This Airport Nightmare Down, George Oxenfeld. Thank you, Maureen. She's my wife. Well, Tom, I have plenty of questions, but we'll just open it up to others. And, and I know Tom is willing to talk about just both the creative process of how he develops films and puts them together, and also some of the uh, real world consequences of scaring up funds and finding financing. So the whole range of the creative process and the business process, Tom is willing to talk about. So with that, I'd be glad to open it up to questions. Already state owned. Um, what's happening on that land? That's, I guess, that's a, a little bit of a, a, a misnomer on my part. So it's a it's a two phase project. There's plans for an inaugural airport, and then um, and then a full build out. So there's about a five thousand acre airport, and then a twenty four thousand acre airport. Um, and the state, I think, owns about. 3,500 or so, I'd have to check the figures for sure, but they own over half of that inaugural airport um, site. The, the larger airport, they don't own nearly as much, but they're you know, not too concerned about that. Um, at the moment, uh, the state mainly kind of rents it out to farmers, um, and it's just kind of sitting dormant. Since uh, these films are primarily environmental, um, how are you securing funding since no one necessarily stands to make a profit from these? Uh... That has been the rub. Um, <laughs> so for the, the environmental history docs have been, um, they almost serve because they're unknown stories to some degree and they're almost educational pieces. We've been lucky to get some funding from foundations and also um, you know, companies and, um, you know, tourism groups um, have been willing to put in some money and funding for it um, because they almost see it as kind of a chamber of commerce piece to some degree of like, oh, look at this wetland that nobody knew was here. Come, come down to, you know, the southern end of Kankakee County or Lake County, Indiana and spend a few dollars sightseeing or uh, shifting sands much the same way. You know, they're kind of a tourism draw, so there is a little bit of, you know, I guess what's the word, you know, self-interest, self -interest, exactly. But we have to be careful with that because they are PBS films, and PBS has a very strict underwriting policy that the underwriter can't have perceived editorial control. So we've had, you know, we couldn't go to, you know, someone who is very interested in, um, Shifting Sands was Arcelor Middle. They're this giant steel conglomerate. Uh, they own a, a massive steel mill on the shores of Lake Michigan. Um, they could have funded the whole film by themselves and we would have loved that. They're actually doing some very interesting things um, in the area. They're taking, you know, they're, they're, they're spending a lot of money cleaning up the area, um, but that would have been a big no-no because -no, um, that would have gotten nixed and never seen the light of day at least on PBS. The distribution landscape's changing every day, especially with Amazon and Netflix, um, and I'm still kind of learning how to navigate those waters myself. Um, the Piatone project has been very difficult for fundraising because I don't know if it really paints anybody in a great light, uh, to be perfectly honest. Um, and, if you, and if you're a, say, an environmental group uh, that's you know, advocating for open lands, we can't take your funding. If you're you know, someone who wants to see the airport constructed, we can't take your funding. Um, there is even, you know, and, and in, you know, the, a lot of our funding comes from you know, kind of these communities where they're, they're very local stories. So they've come from small businesses. Um, it's been a very grassroots effort. Um, but this is kind of, you know, nobody wants to touch this one. So, so we're 
striving really hard to get some grant money and that sort of thing for that project. Yeah, Tom, uh, you mentioned PBS's uh, policy on underwriters. Uh, one of the series that are carrying is about human evolution, and I watched it at the end, it said one of the underwriters is the Koch brothers. And then I, I remember during the one hour special, they kept having scientists on that says, humans have adapted, we've, we've had climate change before, we've had climate change before. <laughs> they must have said that six <laughs> times. Now, the Koch, brother, Koch brothers are in the energy business, right? Mm -hmm. So wh what's the message there? And this is how subtle propaganda works. And um, <laughs> you hear that like six times when you were a kid in high school, you go, oh, hey, what are you getting so wound up about, about you know, cool. climate change, it happens all the time. You know, so these subtle little things can happen to an editor and oh, he's sir. going, oh, well, well, I get my money if I, if I run the whole uh, segment of what the scientist interview was or if I just cut it to where he says, you know, climate change happens all the time. Now, I noticed in your, in your editing of the uh, protests, the protests, there was a guy on a horse with an American flag. You know, that symbol is very iconic in, in America. And it's like, you know, what we were talking about before, our myth, that the cowboy with the big old flag on a horse, that's America. And, and yet that figure is used by both, you know, uh, either side of picking the debate, you know. Everybody wants a cowboy on a horse. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, but I mean, I think and that it's, it's, you know, and it's something that you have to be very careful with as an editor. And I mean, I'm sure that I've fallen victim to it to some degree. Um, you know, with the field, um, with the Piatone project, we're really, you know, it's going to be very difficult for us because we do want to show both sides because this is, you know, at its heart, it's really kind of bringing up some of those ideas of, things that Americans have been debating about since its founding, about, you know, the role of government, how, you know, how much control should the government have over individual freedoms? And I'm not sure what the right answer is. And I, and I want to make sure that the film deals with these very sensitive issues in a, as fairly as we possibly can. So it's going to be a challenge. Okay. Do you ever go into a project thinking you know where it's going to take you and find out through research that, that you either have a different take on it or that a different part of the story pops up and is more interesting than what you started with? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, I think Piatone especially, that's been, you know, it's going to be this project and then <laughs> now it's something totally different. Um, you know, the Everglades of the North, you know, an early edit of that was kind of early American history, we like went back to, you know, the opening of the Erie Canal, the opening of, you know, the Midwest to, to European settlers. And, you know, I mean, we had, we had this really long, we found all of this wonderful information about um, LaSalle's expeditions, you know, through the marsh and all of this sort of thing. And that was 30 minutes of the film. And then we just had to scrap all of it. You know, now, you know, LaSalle is maybe <laughs> five minutes or four minutes of the piece because we, we just felt you, you're often, you often fall down these rabbit holes of this is so fascinating. And then you step back and look back and go, a general audience isn't going to be interested in this at all. I mean, only a really hardcore history buff is going to want to spend 30 minutes watching about, you know, LaSalle's voyage in, in North America. Actually, and also with Everglades, we had a, you know, we, we touched on, uh, you know, the Native American presence in, in the area, and the film still does, but at one time that was about 20 minutes long, and we, we actually showed it to a group of potential investors, and they just, they glazed over, you know, they were like, I thought this was going to be about a wetland, not the, you know, the story of Native Americans in Northwest Indiana, so, you know, yes, I, you're, the short answer to your question is yes. Um, yes, sir. For your time, SIU had another famous documentary filmmaker, Steve James, mm -hmm. I believe, uh, Basketball Chronicles, you wouldn't play ball, and that's good by. 
while you were here or subsequently, have you had any contact with him? Do you know about his, his exploits? I, I do. Uh, he's, he's kind of the, for us SIU film school documentarians, he's kind of the, the patron saint, I guess, of uh, Tell SIU the story alarms. for us who don't. So, um, so if, if you haven't seen the film Hoop Dreams, um, it's one of the best documentaries you can possibly, possibly watch. Um, Steve James, uh, he was a graduate student um, at SIU in the film program, uh, and he's now part of a, um, a cooperative called Cartemquin Films in Chicago. Um, they're really one of the most reputable documentary production companies in the world. Um, if you don't know about them, look them up. They have some tremendous, they were nominated for, uh, actually Steve James was nominated for an Oscar just this past year for a wonderful documentary called Abacus, Small Enough to Jail. It was, uh, it aired on Frontline. Um, and it was about a bank, uh, a, a small bank in Chinatown and it was really the only one that was prosecuted during the, uh, finan after the financial crisis. Fascinating film, he didn't win. He got beat out by another very good film, but <laughs> still was a little. Um, but he's, he's continually made just wonderful, wonderful pieces. Um, and Cartemplin's probably going to get another Oscar nomination for another great film. Uh, I don't think the director has any affiliation with SIU, <laughs> but still he's, uh, it's called uh, uh, Minding the Gap. Uh, and it's another kind of long-term project. Uh, uh, actually, someone I've worked with uh, in my commercial days uh, by the name of Bing Liu. Um, but it, there, so Steve James and really that generation of documentary filmmakers is really kind of the standard that a lot of us are striving to, to meet. And it's always kind of, you say it with a little bit of pride that he went to SIU, you know, you get to say, I went to SIU too. <laughs> um, haven't quite had quite as much success, but I, I hope to get there someday. But what is his genius? Is he finding interesting he, angles? He, or is there, uh, it, well, Cartemquin famously follows um, maybe not as long as the field has followed, but they follow uh, people over time. And they really, you know, they, they do a really good job of following, finding the human element to a story. So it's really, the story could be really anybody, but you fall in love with the character and the person there. And the, the beauty of it is that you begin to feel empathy for these characters and, and, and Hoop Dreams was kind of famous that, you know, it was about um, African Americans from the, the west side of Chicago and Cabrini Green and the film was one of the highest grossing documentaries and all of these, you know, white suburban kids went to it because it was about basketball and they, you know, and it, and it really began to open up conversations between communities that didn't really talk to one another. Um, I hope someday, I, you know, the, that's kind of, you know, really the field was, you know, I didn't know what we were trying to do, but we were trying to mimic that style to some degree that we wanted to follow characters and tell a character driven piece. It's really hard to do, I'm finding out. It's a lot easier to take an issue and, you know, do the research and, you know, here's the history and here's the experts. You know, because when you start following people over time, you get connected to them. You, you know, you're worried about, you know, how, how are you going to portray them? And there's so many different avenues that you can take. And really, Cartemquin and, and Steve especially has found a really good way of, you know, how to pick the best bits and tell a really compelling story with all of this footage. I mean, they shoot hours upon hours upon hours and you know, distill it down to, his last project was a mini series, so maybe eight hours or something like that. Also that one, I'll give uh, uh, America to Me, uh, which is about uh, Oak Park River Forest High School in the Chicago suburbs, also well worth checking out. So he, Steve James has gotten a sufficient plug uh, today. Um, but, yeah. Ah, <laughs> there's actually, um, so we're done, we're, we're done with the Indiana Dunes project. We're, we're, it, it, it's out in the world and people can use it how they want. Um, 
Actually, there's already a film about Enbridge Line 5. Um, Could you explain what that is? Oh, so for those of you who don't know, so you know Michigan, it's a mitten, and then there's a little bit up here, and there's the Straits of Mackinac. Well, there's an oil pipeline running under the Great Lakes at that juncture, and it has folks reasonably concerned that an oil leak there could wreak havoc in one of the most prized freshwater, you know, sources in in the world. Um, Enbridge, you know, assures us that it's fine and they're going <laughs> to, there was an eye roll, probably appropriately so. Um, so, you know, there's, a, there's a, a big debate and a lot of talk, should we shut this down? Being someone who lives in Chicago, who gets my drinking water from Lake Michigan, I, I would love to see it shut down. Um, there is, and this actually goes kind of back to the uh, PBS guidelines a little bit, there, the film that was made about this was sponsored entirely by, I believe, Patagonia. And I think it maybe hasn't had as widespread, uh, you know, circulation because, you know, it, I don't believe it can be on PBS because of, you know, even though it's a sportswear company, but they have a clear mission of environmental, um, you know, advocacy. So I, I, don't, I don't know if they've tried to get it on PBS but it, it hasn't, I haven't seen it on PBS or Netflix or anything like that. I think it's called Line 5. I'm not 100% I'm sure, but it is, it is out there. Um, yes, with, uh, with the Kankakee Marsh, when you're going uh, north on I-57, and you're south of Kankakee, you're going through a fairly large marshland on the east side of the road. Mm -hmm. Is that part of the remnant of Kankakee Marsh, or is that something else? That I think that's kind of the fringes of the of the of the uh, the marsh. The marsh was kind of concentrated, actually, a little further east of Kankakee, um, really closer to the state line. Mm -hmm. um, but a, a really great place to see it is if you're ever on I-65 between. Indianapolis and Chicago, when you approach the Kankakee River, um, you'll see some marshy areas, but this is the area that's been drained. So you'll see these massive straight line waterways, and those are the, the ditches that were dug in, a, to, in order to drain it. But there's still an old, um, it was kind of a game preserve, and it's right at I-65 that was preserved by this uh, wealthy industrialist in Chicago who wanted it as his hunting grounds. So that area was never drained off. Um, but yeah, that's, and, and the, the thing that fascinated me about that story that I never would have guessed was in the late 1800s, Indiana actually uh, allocated money in their general assembly to pay for the straightening of the river or the blowing up of this rock ledge in Illinois. So Indiana money was spent in Illinois. I don't know if that could possibly happen <laughs> today or how that came about, but. And okay. Plus an, an Illinois Senator, Paul Douglas, was a huge uh, proponent of the Indiana Dunes. Oh, Jones, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yes, he's featured in uh, Shifting Sands very prominently. Um, it's actually, yeah, there were a lot of, it was actually, to, to a large degree, it was actually Illinois that saved that area to, to a large degree. Um, a lot of people from the University of Chicago um, were part of this group that advocated for its initial preservation as a state park. Um, it, was almost, uh, it was almost made a national park back in the, um, right in, the, in 1917 uh, at the advent of the National Park Service, uh, but World War I kind of got in the way. But the reason being was that the new director of the National Park Service uh, was a Chicagoan. Um, who lived in Hyde Park, by chance. So, uh, um. Could you say a little bit about the creative process? I mean, are you, when you're developing a film idea, are you in a, an apartment with some friends? I mean, do you have a couple partners who you brainstorm with, or do you kind of work separately? Do you have little lanes that each of you follow? Or? Um, you know, I think each project is different, um, but there's definitely a group of us that have, have worked together on nearly, you know, Probably the, the Frank Lloyd Wright piece was probably the closest I came to having like a project that was my own, um, you know, all by myself. I'm sitting in the editing room, but even then, you know, I had to, I sent an edit to my production partner and he, it used to be an hour and a half and he was like, no, this has to be an hour. There's too much of this, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright history. Ken Burns already did that. Who do you think? 
who do you think you are? That type of thing. Um, but it is very much like, so Everglades of the North actually started with, um, it was the brainchild of this uh, reporter um, who grew up near the river, uh, a little town called Lake Village. Um, which you ever go th if you ever go through Lake Village, there is no longer a lake in Lake Village because it was drained uh, at the turn of the 20th century. And he really wanted to share this story. So he kind of recruited um, Pat Wisniewski, who was uh, the intern at the uh, TV station, and then Brian Kelly is my production partner, and then I came on board. So, so that was very much, but it was kind of like Brian and I would retreat off and kind of you know, edit together and then show them something. And they'd say, oh, it's not quite right. And then we'd come back to it. And I, and I do, I would say that I kind of like to work by myself and then throw it at people and get feedback. Um, Cause I like to pace around my apartment and talk to my dogs and that sort of thing. Um, but, but certainly the, the inception is very, is also kind of a collaborative process, you know, Hey, I have this idea. Do you think this is going to, do you think there's a story there? Um, that type of thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, filmmaking is, you know, it's, it's such a, at least of any scale is, you know, even a small scale like this is very much a collaborative process. You know, you watch the credits and it's, Oh, many, many people contribute to these projects. A lot of them volunteers. I'm very grateful for them. So. Can I ask a yeah. um, about funding, when you talk about the PBS caveats, when you start a project, do you, do you know it's going, do you have a go ahead from PBS? Or are you, you're starting a project and then looking for funding and you know that, that hesitation of taking funding for certain people if you want to pitch this? Yeah, so. Excuse me. Um, I've been very fortunate. So the PBS station that I used to work at has been kind of our gateway to the PBS network. They've been a godsend. So the production manager there, I can kind of send, you know, a trailer or a proposal and say, hey, I'm thinking about this. Would you, you know, usually they give like a letter of intent saying when this is finished, what we will air it and then um, we'll just we'll make it available to the rest of the network. Um, so so then you kind of take that and you go, okay, I have this. This is my golden ticket to say, if you are an underwriter, you know, your company or organization will be seen on X amount of stations. Um, so, but you have to, you know, approach it with that. Who's going to be the, you know, the red flag to PBS. And on occasion I failed, um, you know, for the Frank Lloyd Wright piece, took a little bit of money, you know, not, not a lot, but just a little bit from, uh, you know, like the tourism board in Kankakee County. Uh, the distributor was like, no, we're not going to send it out. So you had to go to a different distributor and they have the same guidelines, but they accepted it, whereas the other one didn't. Um, so it's a, it's a, so there's no hard and fast rules. You know, you kind of have to, and on occasion you have to make your pitch like, hey, they gave us money, but we were already 90% done with it when they came on board. Like we showed it to them at the end of the project. We didn't change a thing and they still felt that it was, you know, something they wanted to donate to. Um, so it's a real, it's a fine line. It's an art, not a science. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So if we're here in, in the audience and would be interested in seeing um, Shifting Sands or uh, the Grand Kankakee Swamp March. Yes. Um, how do we have access to that? Um, so right now they're a little limited, uh, but DVDs are available through the PBS station. Um, which it's, it's Lakeshore PBS. Um, so you can either go online and for, you know, and it's kind of their uh, underwriting gifts. So if you donate 20 bucks to the station, you can get a DVD of Everglades of the North or Shifting Sands. Um, it should, I mean, WSIU's here, they do have access to it. So you can maybe plan a bug that they could air it again. Uh, that would be great too, but uh, probably the fastest and quickest way is to just order a DVD through the television station. Any advice for the film students here? We have a film program, as you know. Yes. So, uh, especially if they want to get into this type of work, like, uh, is the Chicago area vibrant for hiring, or what I, that's a very difficult question, but do you have any uh, thoughts to share? Um, yeah, uh, Chicago is a great, great place. It has a very vibrant film community. Um, you can get in as kind of a production assistant. Probably there's 
you know, if you watch NBC, you know, there's like seven shows with Chicago in the title. Um, so it's, you can kind of get involved and kind of see the inner workings of, um, you know, network production that way. There's also a very strong documentary film pro or film community there. Um, Cartemquin has a great internship program. It's highly competitive. Um, but that, I, I was an intern there for a short time, you know, just a great, great opportunity to just see how an organization like that functions. Um, but something that, you know, I'd love to see, and I actually mentioned this to John as we were having coffee this afternoon, is kind of a business of filmmaking program because, you know, so much of film school is, you know, how do you craft the film or how do you tell the story? And you kind of got out thinking, oh, everything will just kind of take care of itself. But really, 50 or 60 percent of your time is really kind of spent trying to sell the film to somebody and get somebody to watch it. I mean, there's a lot of different ways of filming, but if you're going into, you know, if you want to make narratives, you have to learn the art of the pitch. Or if you're, you know, making documentaries, you have to find underwriters. So, um, you know, so if you can find someone who, you know, find a production company that's kind of cobbling together a living, I guess, and maybe figure out how they're doing it. Because, you know, there, there's some years where I've thought maybe filmmaking is not for me anymore. Um, but, yeah, I think the, as soon as you can, you know, get an internship or a job, because I think, you know, getting involved is, is great. You know, and also a, a great thing that was so instrumental to me was actually the people that I met at SIU, because a large group of us went to Chicago, you know, started working on, you know, assisting on TV commercials and this sort of thing. And a lot of them kind of got more involved in commercial production or corporate video work. So they had all these wonderful toys. So, so for an American home, I was able to say, hey, can I borrow your camera for the day? And they were like, yeah, sure. Or, you know, I can give it to you at, you know, a quarter of the rate or something like that. And I mean, the film could not have been made without, you know, their help. So stay close to the people that you meet here because they're going to be the people that will help you later in life. Let me ask one final question, and then then feel free to grab Tom uh, afterwards and, and pick his mind. But in terms of future projects, are, is your head working where you're thinking, God, I'd like once I finish the airport, I'm going to do this and this and this, or are you just so locked in on what it takes to get this done that you're not really? The, you're you're always kind of thinking about that next project, and really probably and something that I need to learn to do better is to have those next projects lined up and already be raising funds for them, you know, because really what you want to do is be raising development funds for your project for two years from now. And that way, once you finish the one that's in production, then you can jump right into that one. I've had kind of gaps where it's like, okay, I'm done with this one. All right, let's ramp up the uh, fundraising thing again. Um, there's two that, so my, uh, the, uh, the lady that I worked on, Shifting Sands and Everglades of the North on with, she has a project that she's working on right now that is, she's, uh, she lives in Valparaiso, Indiana. And at one time, Valparaiso, Indiana was a sundown town. So anyone of color had to be out by sundown, or at least that's, and these were all over the United States. It wasn't just Valparaiso, Indiana. It wasn't just towns in the South. It was all over. Um, well, it's the story of the first black, black family that integrated the town. Um, so she's in the early stages of this. Um, the, uh, the son of the woman who made this giant leap, uh, he's now a Valparaiso City Council member. Um, so it has a happy ending to some degree, but there's still a lot of, you know, still a lot of work to be done. Um, so that, that's probably going to be maybe the next project that I at least assist on. Um, and then I read this wonderful book by an author by the name of Charles uh, C. Mann, who uh, he wrote a wonderful book about kind of the future of agriculture in the world. Um, it's called The Wizard and the Prophet. Um, and it's really a, a discussion about, you know, kind of industrial farming versus organic farming and what is the route that we take. Uh, and he did it in a very interesting and balanced way. So I actually have an email out to his agent hoping that he'll give me permission to kind of start exploring that topic. Um, I have not heard, ba heard <laughs> back yet. So uh, send another send one. Send another That's one, right. yeah. So, so that may be the future, but 
we shall see. Great. Mm -hmm. Well, Tom, thank you so much. This was so, uh, so interesting. And well, and, and also, I thank you so much for having me. Uh, thank you to John, to Jordy, the entire staff of the Paul Simon Institute. This has been a real treat, so sure. thank you. Great, and feel free to grab Tom as he's uh, making his way to the pizza. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you, you for coming out.